afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the last webinar of the year, hosted by the Data Science Across Disciplines Research Group within the Institute for the Future of Knowledge at UJ. Today's presentation will be given by Kheri Stale and Langton Rogers. Kheri is a senior manager, and Langton is a manager in actuarial and analytics solutions practice at Deloitte. Uh, they'll be discussing custom analytics through predictive and segmentation operations in the South African telecommunications industry. Welcome, guys, and thank you very much for being here. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you to Professor Harley and to Anthony um, for, for hosting us today. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to spend some time with you guys and um, to share um, quite an exciting uh, service offering that uh, we have um, at Deloitte Analytics South Africa. Um, uh, we'd like to share some of the success that we have had with this particular service offering um, and really touching on uh, kind of the machine learning and data science aspects of it, but more importantly, really, how those machine learning and data science aspects um, are used to um, flow into a business problem um, that we have had with, with our clients um, and uh, really looking to solve um, this particular business problem, um, you know, over the course of, of a good few months with of engagement. <clears throat> um, before we get into the details, maybe Kerry and I will just do a brief introduction of ourselves. Um, so my name is Langton Rogers. Um, I have been, I am a member of the Deloitte um, analytics team, uh, actuarial and analytics solutions team um, at Deloitte South Africa. Um, I'm a manager um, in, in our analytics division. Uh, I've been with the team now for seven years, uh, working mainly on telecommunications clients, um, as well as uh, various banking clients. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a background in applied mathematics from the University of the Department And um, yeah, uh, I suppose that's me. Kerry, would you like to do an introduction for yourself? Thank you, Langton. Yes, um, as Langton has said to everyone on the call, thank you so much for having us and uh, spending some time with us today. Um, I'm really looking forward to sharing with you guys this uh, advanced analytics use case focusing on customers in the South African telecommunications space. Um, as Langton has, has mentioned, my name is Kerry Stale. I am a senior manager in the actuarial analytic solutions team here within Deloitte. Um, I've been with the team since the release of Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows, so quite a while. And uh, I'm really looking forward to, to spend some time with you all today, specifically as Langton has mentioned, to kind of show a practical application of some advanced analytics and machine learning models that we've physically done, um, the processes that we've gone through to, to basically implement such a solution, um, the hurdles that we faced and really just try and share with you guys some of the lessons that we've learned in this journey that I hope can, you all can take to heart and take on your own data science journeys that lies ahead of you. Um, so from that perspective, the real aim of today is to share with you guys what we've done. And from my perspective, I think the most important message that I want to get across is the intent that we want to share is really to show this, this collision, if you will, of data science and business. One does not exist with the other, without the other. And it is of uh, paramount importance, I think, that um, we share with you kind of what we did, why we did it, how we did it, and what that ultimately resulted into. So without further ado, I would like for us to get cracking on that exactly on that point. So let's immediately um, start off just with a quick introduction um, from our side uh, on Deloitte. Um, I want to spend just a couple of seconds talking to you all about who exactly Deloitte is. Um, I want to then also going to ask Langton just to maybe gloss over some of the highlights and what we as a team do. Um, then I want to wade slowly into the waters of this use case that we want to bring to you all, just setting the scene, giving you some of the business context, and then going into a little bit more detail on exactly what we did, um, how we did it, and ultimately some of the results that we've achieved from it. So, just as a start, um, I think if, uh, if anyone asks you, you know, what does Deloitte do, you'd be forgiven to think that uh, Deloitte is an auditing company. Um, it is by no stretch of the imagination only an audit or an audit company. It is the largest consulting firm in the world. We span about 150 to 200,000 employees globally. Um, of those employees, we claim about 20,000 analytics and advanced um, analytics practitioners. Um, within the South African context specifically, um, we have about uh, 40 to 60 um, specific um, individuals focusing predominantly on advanced analytics. 
And Deloitte globally participates quite strongly on all things assets that pertains to uh, artificial intelligence, the uh, building of machine learning solutions, the rollout thereof, and also the infrastructure within which these um, solutions run on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, enough of that from a global perspective. Langton, would you mind me just quickly give us a bit of an overview of what the actuarial and analytics team does? That's the team that Langton and myself are part of. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Kerry and I have both been part of uh, the actuarial and analytics solutions team for our entire careers at Deloitte. Um, our team is really built upon kind of three, maybe four main pillars. Um, of course, the actuarial side, uh, where we have a very strong focus on um, healthcare actuarial work because of our uh, director, Ashley Theopanagy's uh, interest and her qualifications lie within that space. Um, the analytical solutions team as well, where Harry and I spend the majority of our time, where we try and uh, incorporate data science um, solutions for our, for, our, for our clients' problems. And then also because of um, obviously the very strong uh, audit focus um, that Deloitte has, we, we tend to lend our expertise from a data uh, perspective into the audit support work as well. Um, you'll see there on the top right hand side of the screen, life sciences and healthcare. That's probably our fourth pillar that's growing um, quite significantly at the moment um, because of the effects of you know, COVID um, and the, the growing need for a strong healthcare practice out of Africa. Um, we are uh, obviously growing in, in that division as well um, with, our, with our SMEs mm -hmm. in that space as well. Um, of course, we're not going to go into each one of these um, offerings that we're here today, but I think really the key part that I would like to get from here is that our team is, um, we've got experts and qualifications across the range. I mean, uh, Kerry, for example, started out in actuarial science. He finished with mathematics and statistics. Myself, I'm applied mathematics and computer science. Um, we've got CAs, we've got actuaries, we've got engineers. Um, we really do hire a, a large range of um, professionals. And that helps us approach um, a wide range of problems from a, a multitude of different perspectives and really helps us um, come up with very unique solutions for our clients. Absolutely. And, um... Now we've got a quite a diversified set of characters in our team. We also have pharmacists, we have had mathematicians, statisticians, we've had a headmaster also, but really all just pooling our resources and knowledge together to answer our client's question um, to the use of data, which really is the crux of why we are here today. So um, as a last kind of a point of introduction, um, data scientists and very much the spine of the team that, that we um, are, are part of here within Deloitte. Um, you know, we frequently refer to them as purple people. And I thought it was such a, you know, such a, a, a good point to raise at this point of our presentation, simply because the concept of purple people in data science is very much the core of the message that we really wanna to bring to you all today. The reason we call it purple people is because a data scientist in our view is really someone that kind of intersects that world where business has their requirements and coming with technical expertise to answer those, those business questions. And a data scientist very much is right there on the fringe where that collision of business and data science um, or the advanced analytics where, where that point where it collides. And from that perspective, you know, on, on within our team itself, we really pride ourselves to have an immense amount of business um, skill sets and acumen, um, speaking to industry knowledge, understanding how our clients' business models work, what their challenges are, where those challenges arise from. Um, and it comes, those type of, of, that type of knowledge and gaining that type of insight really comes when you look at problems or you look at your clients or those that you're building uh, advanced analytic solutions for, if you look at it from a business lens understanding what it is that we need to do, what will be successful at the end of the day, and what makes what we're building absolutely fit for purpose requires that business element or recipe, uh, uh, ingredient to that recipe. The other important ingredient would be obviously our technical expertise. And I'm pretty sure today on this call, um, there's a lot of people that already has a lot of uh, good, strong understanding when it comes to technical analytical expertise. So this is really comes down with your ability to work with data, your ability to transform it, wrangle it, move it, to derive insights other than just pure descriptive statistics 
and ultimately apply some of the machine learning algorithms to come up with something that's truly special, but constantly overlaid with the business spectrum of what the context is, what the problem is, so that what we do, how we use the data and the technologies to build out solutions supported by that data ultimately addresses the business question. And the reason why I was willing to pause for longer than a minute on this slide is that is absolutely the crux of what we're going to be discussing with you all today. It is this concept of a business problem driven and identified by business people and being able to answer that with our data science and advanced analytics expertise. So with that being said, um, I'm immediately going to hand over to, to Langton. And what Langton is going to do is he's essentially just going to give us that initial executive summary of this telecommunication use case that we are going to be presenting to you today, um, just to set that scene for you and get an understanding of the terminology that we're going to be using. Cool. Thank you, everyone. Um, so, yeah, basically, we thought that the best way to be able to do this was to, to take the abstract that you would have seen in the advert and uh, basically just kind of break it out into component by component, um, just to kind of lay the scene uh, of, of what we're going to be speaking about today. So for number, the first line really is um, personal or below the line marketing campaigns often mistarget target their audience and can lead to customer dissatisfaction and spend cannibalization. Maybe just a couple of points um, below the line. Um, in the sense really means, uh, you know, campaigns that are targeted toward, towards individual customers. Um, if you contrast this with above the line, um, that's obviously campaigns that are readily available to anyone to, um, to engage in. So you could walk, for example, into a pick and pay, right? And you can see a banner um, hanging off the wall saying that you can buy two, two liter molds for 30 Rand. That's available to anyone and it's above the line campaign. Whereas, you know, the below the line campaigns are really like if you were to log on to your pick and pay smart shopper app and you see the campaigns that have been pushed through to you, um, that's basically below the line campaigns. Spend cannibalization in that sense is, well, if you are targeting your, uh, your customers incorrectly with below the line campaigns, that basically means that um, the customer can spend more or has greater spend potential than what the campaign is actually extracting from um, in its current state. And you obviously need to try and minim minimize that spend cannibalization. Um, and that's, of course, part of, part of the model that we, that we deal with. Now, to basically address this problem, um, Deloitte came up with a solution called, that we call marketing as a service, or MAS. Now, our, the primary uh, focus of this is to identify what campaign, and which for the Lime campaign specifically, is relevant to an individual customer ensuring that the campaign that is pushed to this customer is suited to this customer's past and anticipated behavior in terms of monetary spend. So what has the customer spent in the past and how has the customer used that product? And using the past history of that product and his um, behavior with that product, what, will that what do we anticipate that customer do in the future? Once we know what that customer is going to do in the future, we can obviously associate a monetary price to it um, as well as some sort of timeline um, to be able to optimize that customer's monetary spend and his usage with that particular product. Now, the solution that we are working with here combines um, a couple of um, advanced analytics algorithms, um, segmentation algorithms and predictive models to be, to be able to, for us to understand what a customer wants and how much of it, what a customer can afford and when to target that customer with the tailored proposition. We're going to talk about the details of um, how those models work with each other to really get um, a result that is greater than the sum of the parts of each one of the individual models. Um, this solution is particularly relevant in a fast moving prepaid telecommunication sector, and this is where we've had the most success um, with this particular solution. Um, the use case that we're going to be talking about today is in the prepaid space and low value recharges. And when we talk about low value, we really are talking about customers that, you know, only spend, you know, anything from five rand to 10 rand a day on, on recharges. Um, sometimes it's a little bit higher, but typically within that sort of price range. Now, because you can, you can appreciate that, you know, this talks to a large range of our population within South Africa, um, and there, there are a multitude of subscribers, um, that, that kind of fit the sort of profile. Um, it does 
uh, result in a large and rich database for machine learning modeling, making it a very worthwhile use case in this regard. Mm. Um, and then, of course, using MOS, uh, we are able to target individual customers with these tailor-made offerings um, and basically moving the marketing campaigns from above the line to below mm. the line. Um, which increases the average revenue per user significantly for um, our telecommunications client. Just one point, um, of course, uh, just due to the respect um, for the relationship between ourselves and our clients, um, we, of course, have to refer to our clients as the clients, and we can't actually mention any names or give um, actual figures or results from that, but um, I'm sure you guys will get the point over the course of, of over the coming time. Thanks, Nathan. And um, yeah, a couple of really important concepts if, if you think about it. And I'm going to spend some time um, just quickly. I think Langton has summarized at a high level what it is that we've done. He's introduced some terms for us um, above the line, available promotions to everyone, below the line, selected few, only this customer can buy it, or this group of customers are exposed to it, spend cannibalization. You know, when basically a good way to think about it, for example, in, the, in, a, in a telecommunication space, if you are a customer that always buys, let's for example say for 10 Rand, you buy 100 megabytes of data. If I was to proposition you with an offer that says, listen, buy 100 megabytes of data for 8 Rand, you as a customer will always purchase it. But as a telco provider, you'll technically earn 2 Rand less. That is a good example of cannibalization. When you push a promotion onto a customer who converts on it, but at the end of the day, you as the client actually um, achieve a lower revenue target. And that's, that's, that concept of cannibalization is absolutely critical. So that being said, um, with our executive summary done, I wanted to spend some time just to give you guys kind of a practical run through of how um, our business model for the client that we work with, how that actually works. It is transferable to many industries that have similar type of, of, of business models. But I want to pause for a moment and just discuss exactly what we are talking about for this session. This session, we're talking about the South African market, telecommunications, and specifically the prepaid telecommunications um, uh, market. So let's just for a moment get introduced to a few characters, if you will, of this play. I want to introduce to you all here a Mr. Prepaid uh, customer. Mr. Prepaid customer, uh, you know, he has a cell phone. Um, he has a prepaid, con uh, he is already on prepaid. So basically what uh, Mr. Prepaid customer, what a few things we can tell about him or that people really say about him is he has a specific spending profile, which means that as a customer, you know, um, typically over a period of time, you can deduce kind of, you know, um, what spending bracket that customer falls in. Is he a, a 50 rand customer, 100 rand customer per month or whatever the case might be, um, but you can kind of peg him at a specific price point. He has a usage profile, so you know that he uses, let's say, 20 or 30 megabytes per month, for example, and he uses, for argument's sake, let's say 20 megabytes of minutes and possibly a few SMSs in between. The point being is we've got a customer, Mr. Prepaid customer, we can already deduce a few things about him, how much does he spend, and once he starts spending things, what does he use it on? So let's quickly go through the typical prepaid business model. Mr. Prepaid customer, he has a cell phone, and from that cell phone, he can activate a recharge. I think a lot of us will be familiar with that, but you can go to a shop, buy a voucher, do it on the phone through SSD. Um, but fundamentally, I have a cell phone and I purchase a recharge, which in essence creates a wallet for Mr. Prepaid customer. And with that wallet, he can spend. Now, what does he do with that wallet? Well, he can buy above the line um, products and services, in this particular case, we will most likely be talking about bundles, and these bundles are the ones we're familiar with. So it's a case where I'm going to keep using the example of for 10 Rand, you buy 100 megabytes worth of data, you purchase that, that 10 Rand price comes out of your wallet, a wallet which you've built up through uh, recharges. And as you can imagine, every customer, they use their um, prepaid services for different reasons. You have guys that seriously inclined to voice guys that seriously inclined to data, some that might be there for the messaging or whatever the case might be. Um, but fundamentally, when you, when you look at a customer, you can start to deduce, you know, what does he actually use his prepaid services for? Um, and from that, you can start basically building up that customer profile. So Mr. Prepaid customer, he recharges, 
builds a wallet, purchase a bundle, and then he consumes that bundle so that by the time the bundle is done, he would need to recharge again. And then from that perspective, the cycle continues. So that in a very broad strokes. And if any of my friends from the telecommunication sector is on this call right now, I apologize. I know that this is a very mile wide inch deep cover of the prepaid telecommunication business. But I think for the purposes of today's session, this is a healthy um, uh, uh, picture to keep in your mind. Recharge, buy a bundle, use the bundle, recharge again. All right. On the flip side of the coin, another ca uh, character for our little play is Mrs. Telco Provider. Now let's take for a moment and one, we now know how the prepaid business works from a customer end, but let's focus on some of the activities that we see typically within the telco itself. Mrs. Telco Provider, you know, she is ultimately at the end of the day, she has the responsibility to ensure that uh, her customers are well looked after, that those customers are experiencing um, a high level of customer experience, customer satisfaction and, and the likes. Um, but fundamentally, what they are most interested in is to make sure that the, the, the customer value is as high as possible. How do you do that? Well, basically what you want to do is you want to make sure that if we have a customer here that is focused predominantly on data, that that customer either uses as much data as he or she can, or that you expand that, um, that product portfolio either from data towards voice make sure that the customer knows what services are available for them. Now let's take a harder look at what someone like Mrs. Telco provider can offer, um, because this is very much where our project started. What Mrs. Telco provider will realize from time to time is they will do their own little um, analyses and they might um, identify that Mr. Prepaid customer is showing some um, detrimental behavior. It could either be that Mr. Prepaid customer might want to churn, uh, there's a few signals you can typically follow for that churn being the case where a customer leaves your services. So you might be at one company and move to another. Or you can see that, look, Mr. Prepaid customer used to spend 100 Rand a month, all of a sudden he's sitting at 50 Rand. There's probably a chance for us to boost that value up given that it was higher, now it's lower. What's the reason? What can we offer Mr. Prepaid customer so we can get back to his previous spending levels? Um, or whatever the case might be. Fundamentally, she is interested to make sure value is high experience and customer experience is, is, is uh, high with it. So what will she do when she see this deteriorating behavior? Well, as we said, Mr. Prepaid customer can buy above the line um, promotions, services, and campaigns. What she can do, Mrs. Pre uh, Telco provider, is she can actually push a below the line offer that addresses whatever she spotted at Mr. Prepaid customer. So as an example, I've given an example here at the bottom, but you know, our customer might usually buy, let's say 10 Rand, we might get hundred megabytes for, but for, because we're seeing a deteriorating spend, we might try and stimulate or intervene or treat that customer um, with, for example, something like a 12 Rand, 150 megabyte bundle, right? The reason being slightly more valuable, it will get his spend levels up. We've got reason to believe that he can spend a little bit more given past experience or whatever the case might be. Um, but fundamentally, it comes down to that intervention once you've seen a deterioration in, in behavior. And that is very much what, what um, some of the functions within the telco provider tries to achieve. But it comes with its own risks. The example uh, given already by, by, by Langton around cannibalization, the risk being if you do not accurately peg what Mr. Prepaid customer actually wants, you could misprice what you offer to him. Again, the example being, it would not be a smart idea to offer him an uh, uh, eight rand 100 megabyte bundle because he can already, he was probably already gonna buy the 10 rand 100 megabyte bundle. So if you offer him the same thing for cheaper, he will convert, but you might at the end of the day actually uh, earning less revenue than had you just leave him alone. So that is the risk that comes along with, with cannibalization. Finally, um, in conclusion, so what will Mrs. Telco provider do? She will set up the special promotion or below the line offer. Um, Mr. Prepaid customer couldn't be happier. He converts, he buys it, he uses data again. He's reminded again on why he used to use data so much. And the idea being that once he's had his below the line offer, you release um, you know, spending and usage profiles and patterns as you was before, thereby negating the bad cons uh, the deteriorating behavior that we've identified. That was now a, a long introduction to give you guys a little bit of a feel of how the business works, 
what uh, the telcos do, among many other things, when they intervene in customers' value. And it is within that context that I want to position what we are going to be showing you guys today around what we tackled with our client and how we went about it. Um, Langton, would you mind maybe just giving us a view of the client and the problem? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so I think what's important again, just to go back to really the message that we're trying to get across to you today is that, sure, we use data science machine learning to be able to, to address this very specific client problem, but it really falls in a much broader scheme um, of our client's business. And that's really demonstrated across, um, you know, kind of that little process flow continuum that you see at the top there. Um, of course, you can appreciate a major telecommunications client in South Africa um, will have everything from a technical team to an operational team that will then flow through to a sales team, um, to a customer value man management team, which we'll talk about a bit more about in a second. And of course, that then flows through to, you know, how are the offers communicated? Um, are, is all the governance structures uh, appropriately enforced, right? And then research and development, does everything, everything that has happened, you know, coming before that, is that feedback loop appropriately incorporated um, uh, and, and, may, and, and optimized going, going down the line uh, in the future? But the key area that we uh, typically play in with this sort of project is the customer value, value management team. Um, typically referred to as CBM. Now, what CBM does, it can be broadly broken down into kind of three main pillars, acquisition, in-life management, and retention. Now, acquisition is basically, how do we, how does this customer value management team acquire or bring on new customers um, onto, their, onto their customer base? In-life management is, okay, now that we've got these customers, how can we optimize their behavior? Um, how can we expand their product basket how can we make sure that um, they are correctly mapped to the correct products that they that they are supposed to be using? And retentions then is, of course, every customer will at some point in time consider leaving um, your particular uh, uh, your the, your particular subscriber base or customer base. And what interventions can we enforce there um, to make sure that they that they remain on the customer base and you know then hopefully go back to a healthy in life management cycle. Um, our marketing as a service solution kind of plays across all three of those pillars, but really focuses, I would suggest, on the in-life management side, um, as well as maybe more on the retention side as well, to really make sure that customers do not leave the base, um, and so we retain them, and then also the in-life management space where we make sure that they are properly optimized um, to, uh, to, to map, um, you know, to their correct products and use their products uh, optimally. Now, typically a customer value management team um, will, it, it's obviously, you know, very data heavy um, because we are receiving all of the customer data, you know, everything from spend behavior, um, the history, and then of course, if you're predicting in the future as well. Um, but at a very, very high level and, um, but by, by no means the only operation is very much marketing based. So they will have marketing experts in there. And it's very, very important to be able to marry the data and analytics side to a correct marketing campaign and marketing strategy. Um, but of course, with the customer, uh, with the customer life cycle, there are a number of issues that always occur <clears throat> um, when you know dealing with the customer base and dealing with uh, customer life cycles. Um, and let's see then as we bring them through here. So if there is you know, a particular suite of marketing campaigns that um, the telecommunications client, for example, is trying to push to their customer base, these are kind of the high level or some of the main problems that they would have to consider um, uh, on a, you know, basically on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm just gonna pull up a little laser pointer here um, just so we can talk about each one, or each one of them a little bit more closely. A poor campaign return on investment. Basically, the, the client has pushed significant uh, investments towards a particular campaign, but they're not seeing a return on that. Basically, the customers are not taking up those particular campaigns. Cannibalization, which we've spoken about already, um, the more they buy, the less we earn. And that's kind of, you know, that whole 10 Rand for 100 megabytes versus 8 Rand for 100 megabytes that Harry was talking about. There seems to be that 2 Rand gap that they are obviously losing out on as opposed to, can we stretch them just a little bit further? 
um, the untargeted campaigns, let's just blast the base, right? So they kind of, you know, um, do a little bit of a scattergun approach and say, here is a multitude of campaigns um, and let's see what the uptake is going to be on that. We basically just send it to everyone and hope that something sticks. Of course, um, they're reactive as well. So the client will often uh, say that <clears throat> um, we react to what our customers are doing and we try to give them campaigns that will basically um, suit their needs as opposed to pushing them um, down a route that we want them to go. And that really talks about the whole in-life management cycle. Um, how can we get them to optimize their behavior as opposed to just sending them, uh, sending them offers that would basically just be reacting to um, what they seem to want to do? Active days, customers are not active enough. So uh, we see it a lot with our telecommunications clients is that um, uh, customers play the market. So they will have one SIM card for a particular telco and then they'll have another SIM card for another telco. And based on you know, kind of the offers that they uh, receive for these, for these SIM cards um, or the different um, campaigns that are available on a particular basis, they will switch between, between the SIM cards. Um, you know, one day they'll be using telco one, the next day they'll be using telco two, the next day they'll be using telco three. And obviously we want to make sure that they are always using our client's SIM card on them um, to keep them active on the base and not be, you know, switching and taking money to, to another one of um, the telcos um, in the market. Churn, of course, is a big one. Um, customers are leaving, right? And um, they're not happy with, you know, maybe with um, the offers that they're getting or the value that they're getting from the offers, or maybe they will just buy a new SIM card just simply because the, the, um, the, the welcome offers, as it were, were often better than um, the offers that they were currently using. So they will leave and they'll just get a new SIM card. So the customer maybe itself hasn't churned, but the number is good. Or there's a better offer at another telco and then therefore would leave the customer base. And customers are self-optimized and that really talks back to the whole reactive little bubble there. Customers know what they want, um, but they're not willing to budge from it. How can we be, how can we nudge them? And how can we get them to go down a route that they, that we know that we can optimize a customer spend um, to get to the point that uh, they would be, um, be optimized and spending optimally on the network? Excellent. Thank you, Langton. Um, so I want to take you all through just quickly on how we then took these set of problems, given the client, and we started to break that down into how we were going to solve it. And I want to spend just a, uh, a quick few minutes on this before we go into a little bit more detail on what the solution actually looked like. So based on these uh, issues that, that Langton has essentially identified that the, that the client raised to us, we then spend some time hypothesizing, okay, but if we know that there's a pure, uh, that we're getting poor campaign ROI, how would we solve it? Well, the first thing is if we make a big investment, we want customers to convert on those offers more often, so it needs to be more relevant. Um, if we know that we're cannibalizing, then we need to make sure what we push to them is priced just right. The untargeted campaigns, we need to move away from the shotgun approach and making sure that, you know, and, and just pushing one uh, offer to everyone simultaneously, it could be millions of customers at the same time and start focusing on that segment of one. Then we need to look at a customer, what does he need and send something just for them. Uh, reactive, uh, uh, Langton already mentioned it, but I mean, if you think about it, if you have a customer with deteriorating spend, it is sometimes hard to push him back up, rather identify up front who are the guys that's likely to deteriorate so you can catch them in advance and, 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 and all, uh, all together negate the deteriorating behavior. On active days, the hypothesis is if you give someone something that is valuable to them and something that actually is, uh, speaks to their profile, they'll use it, become more active, it's easier to engage with them, you stimulate customer experience, you reduce churn, and so on and so forth. And it brings us to the point of churn. Instill value of the perception of value, and that is ultimately at the end of the day what's going to keep your customer retained and self-optimized. Well, if we know that people are really stuck in their ways, they get, they buy what they want based on what they need and nothing else, well, then we need to focus on cross-sell and upsell. And over all of this, if you kind of overlay the enterprise strategy, uh, whether it be, guys, we need to push our data business or our voice business, it kind of feeds into how these items can then be solved for. So we then basically, we took these conceptual hypothesized solutions, make no mistake, this was a, a function of a couple of workshops, we then essentially said, all right, for this to work, what would technically need to be done? 
Well, we would first need to have a larger suite of, uh, of offers. It doesn't make sense to have, let's say, a bundle of five rand, 20 rand, and 100 rand. Some people can only afford, let's say, 15 rand a week. Um, so for that from that perspective, our first insight will sh show a little bit how we got there, indicated to us that we really need a, a wider spectrum of, of products to offer. Secondly, is we needed to overlay the, 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 the strategy of the enterprise um, with what we're offering to make sure that one, when we cross on upsell, that we do these in the right locations, really bringing again this focus that we needed to understand the business and our stakeholder very well to understand what would be best for them at the end of the day. And finally, um, we might know ultimately we might have a whole host of products. We might have a good idea around how these products speak to the enterprise strategy, but we ultimately needed to know, we needed to know our customers very, very well, speaking to segmentation, and we needed to know what they're going to do in advance, speaking uh, to that point of reactiveness, moving towards a proactive uh, approach. We need to know what they're going to do, and for that, we needed some predictive models. So what ultimately did we design? We essentially worked with our client. We essentially went through a whole exercise to say, right, here's the full suite of your products. These are your gaps. Additional bundles needs to be built. Secondly, with the customer base that you have, given the information at our, uh, uh, at our disposal, we needed to segment our customers, find pockets of homogenous customers that we have absolute certainty on, on two things. One, what do they want? And what are they willing to spend on? And two, what is that profile? Is this person a 100 Rand customer, a 200 Rand a month customer? Does he, for example, recharge at the end of the day, like a private sector employee, middle, uh, at the end of the month, like private sector, middle of the month for public sector? What kind of device does he have? Um, if we know that we've got an Apple user here um, that only uses about five megabytes um, Per month, you're pretty sure that this is a guy that sits on Wi-Fi the whole day and he probably doesn't need data bundles. Um, so we needed to get that segmentation right. And finally, we needed to build these predictive models that predicted what customers are going to do, thereby reducing cannibalization. Langton, can we quickly just run through some of the uh, building blocks that we went through to get to our answers before we move into the actual solution? Yep, and, and maybe just in terms of time, I will maybe spend just a little bit shorter on this than we have planned. But basically, there were kind of three main pillars um, towards um, our, our case study um, and the steps taken to build the solution. So kind of the first one, and this really is you know pretty general for any sort of data science project. And I would really like you guys to think here about the whole purple people um, slide that we spoke about a little bit earlier. The data analysis here is really from the data science side as well, right? There's data science, data discovery, data exploration, and data preparation. And this is really where kind of the, the key fundamentals and the first steps of a data science project come in. How do you prepare your data um, for your segmentation and your predictive models? How do you come up with, you know, the feature engineering? How do you, uh, what do you, do you need to run um, sort of uh, dimension uh, reduction techniques like PCO over it? Um, what sort of aggregations do you need to do? Which variables um, are strongly correlated to any target variables and which ones are not, right? What are your target variables? What are your other independent variables? And that's really where, you know, the data analysis side comes in. There. But from, um, of course, the rest of it, we need to, we can never work independently from our client. And importantly, we can never work independently from the business problem itself. Is the work that we are doing from a data science side, does it tie back to um, the business itself? We're not operating in a vacuum. We're not operating independently of the business. Are we talking to their product portfolio? Um, <clears throat> are we talking to the actual execution process that the client will go through to push out these campaigns anyway? And is everything that we're doing, does it make sense in terms of the communication structure back to their customer? There's no point in us you know, doing one thing, ending up with a square and then trying to push it into a round hole in the business analysis part. And also importantly is even what we are doing, does this relate back to the client's competitors, right? Can, will this hurt our client in terms of, the, in terms of its competitors more than it will help the client? We need to understand that if our client's competitors are taking similar steps, can we take a step that's slightly different that will give them that competitive advantage? Cool. Gary, I'm going to hand over to you to, for the real crux of the machine learning 
Uh, Langton, sorry, could you guys just look at the Q&A? There's actually a question from Martin. How big was or is the data acquisition? Was the data readily available in the correct formation? A very good question. A stunning question. And one of the points that I want to talk about when it comes to understanding your data, something that Langton just mentioned. Was the data available? Uh, well, let's start with the size. So, yeah, we did have, uh, we were very fortunate that we had a very, very big customer base that we can work with, um, spanning to several millions. Um, so, from that perspective, we had ample sampling, uh, ample uh, customers to sample from. Um, we also had a lot of data that we could train our models on. Um, so, yeah, we, we were far north of 10 million customers um, that, that, that we could deal with. So, that, that was very advantageous. In terms of how ready the data was, yes, there was some data that was already prepared for us. And the reason for it being was we were leveraging at the time uh, the data warehouses and the technology of the client at the time. So we were leveraging strongly off it and also with the intent that if we were to build a solution and we need to hand it over, it needs to actually fit into the existing ecosystems of the client as well. So from that perspective, we did leverage off what was available at the time. And that at the time, was essentially transactional level data for, for each customer. We did not have a ton of demographic info, uh, data, which was kept uh, separate for us for, for good reason, um, but stuff like product holding, the type of devices they had, the tenure, um, you know, the, the daily records, uh, the customer daily records when it comes to recharges, spend, what they bought, how often the amount spent, um, the usage profile on the, on the daily level, you know, the amount of minutes, amount of SMSs, the megabytes used, when it was used, all of those type of things were, were made available to us, which greatly aided us. <clears throat> but at a point that, that, that Langton mentioned, it was, it's so important to understand that data. One of the first things that we said was, look, it's fantastic. We need to um, immediately to understand where the customers are likely to churn. One of the things we need to get our hands on was, for example, call center data. So this is as customers call in, there are certain records generated which we believe we could also use um, just to understand you know, where we might have some customers that's experiencing some sore points, giving a signal for us for potential churn. Um, and Martin, the reason why I like your question so much was because at the time when we got the first sight of, um, of the call center data, we realized it is completely useless. It is unstructured, it is inconsistent. Um, so, so upon the initial investigation, we had to cut that loose. Um, and, and maybe just an uh, interesting story about this particular project is when um, one of the, obviously, let's just reduce it to a single field now called revenue. Um, we spent an immense amount of time looking at revenue for various reasons, you know, to understand, you know, what is the typical spend profile of a customer, um, how much can people spend thereby, what kind of additional products needs to be developed, vital, vital piece of information. It took us a few weeks to realize that the revenue numbers we were looking at excluded that. So, um, and that actually cost us an immense amount of time because, you know, you think to yourself, okay, well, we just quickly multiply everything with 14%, that should be good. No, it's not quite the case. Our correlations changed all of a sudden, our price points that we tested changed all of a sudden. So although the, the data was readily available in many cases, there is still the onus on the data scientists to understand that data, what goes into it, the data quality, um, and specifically what's excluded from it, how you can use it. Um, as, as Langton also mentioned, it is the most vital first step in it, any data science project. Know your data, what you can and can, can't do with it, and how it is actually built up for you. Um, Martin, if there's any other... There is, Gary, uh, from yeah. Pukudo. So you track customers' behavior in order to optimize the customer's usage. How hmm. far in the past do you go to gather the customer behavior? That's also a very good question. So at the time we had, um, essentially when you walk into, let's say, any enterprise, you will find um, two types of, not, an immense amount of, of different types of data, but let's maybe focus on two different types right now. Um, you will have very detailed, uh, let's for now call it daily records of custom interactions. And then the further back you go, um, that data starts to get aggregated. If it's before, it's get put away into cold, into cold storage. Um, in our particular case, what we could do is at an aggregated level, we could go back, I think, up to about four years. Um, but specifically to train our models, we look more towards the six to four month period. Um, and the reason being for that is 
we the, the, the granularity of the data that we had about uh, at the time um, allowed us to, to, to look at six to four months worth of data. And when we specifically started to look at, you know, typical trends at a customer level on a month by month level is also a bit risky. You know, for some reason, someone might have just been out of town for a couple of weeks and then all of a sudden it looks like his trend went down. To some extent that we knew of the customer at the time was his product holding. Um, it was also at the time um, the devices he had. And then obviously the key, uh, the common key through all of it was what is referred to as the MSISDN number. That's the actual cell phone number. So that is the identifier uh, that we use for a SIM card. Um, at the time, this is data that is collected. It was actually prior to the big copy implement, uh, implementation, but with the NDAs that get signed, the data that gets generated from a customer just by, for normal billing purposes, um, these are the, that's mostly the, the information that we use to train the, 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 these models that we'll discuss in a moment of time. Cool, okay. Um, if there's nothing else, please do feel free to interrupt. Um, and we can definitely speak a little bit more on the data right now. Um, it is undoubtedly one of the most important concepts in any data science project. But let's maybe focus a little bit more right now with the problem uh, uh, in mind, with the steps we've taken to understand it. I want to spend some time talking to you actually how we stitch this solution together. So fundamentally, um, we can almost summarize the components of the solution to three parts, the pillars, if you will. The first was segmentation. We can talk about that in a moment. The next was value predictions. And the next was propensity predictions, right? We started off pure and simple with segmentation. The reason we started with segmentation, um, and it's something that we'll talk about in a moment's time as well, is we needed to essentially take this enormous customer base. We needed to run a couple of um, clustering algorithms over it. We tried you know, K-means. We ran uh, self-organizing maps, which actually at the end of the day proved to be the most useful one. And also uh, K-means nearest neighbor. Um, but SOMS was at the end of the day, the ones that we proved to be the most useful. And I'll touch on why that was the case. Um, we ran 16 segments at the time and we ran it over pretty much a large, the large majority of the data we had, speaking to the usage profile, the megabytes, the minutes, the SMSs, the spend profile, how much you bought, how much you pay, how much you recharge, and also to a degree, um, some of the device holdings that they had. From that, we basically could um, separate the base out into a number of, very, very important, important step because although we knew what the bigger problems was, although we already went through very detailed exercises to understand what the issues are and what's at our disposal to solve it, um, we needed to be able to basically break the base up in such a way that we can create our homogenous groups and then actually build out our predictive models on top. But, and this is an incredibly important point that I want to mention right now, when we started off um, kind of the context of this, we started off by saying we were working with the CVM team. The CVM team is, uh, they are very data savvy. There is no doubt about it. But to call them data scientists at the time, I think might've been a bit of a stretch. They were predominantly focused on marketing. So if I was to go to them and I would say, look guys, fantastic news. We ran this nearest neighbor clustering algorithm. It worked fantastically. The first question is, how does that work? Um, what does the answers mean? Um, these segments that you talk about, we've got teams dealing with segments, your segments look completely different to ours. Um, and that is an incredibly big challenge that we sometimes find in data science projects, in that your main consumers, your clients, or the people that you're delivering for, is not, they're not necessarily technical people. And that onus to explain what we are doing, to move away from that black box mentality that we're shoveling data into an algorithm and kicking out answers on the other side without understanding it. That onus to give that confidence and install that confidence and explain in layman terms what it is that we are actually busy doing, that falls to the data scientist. In this particular case, our self-organizing maps uh, outputs actually work very well. It produced segments that our client actually understood very well as well. They could relate to it, they were familiar with it, and that immediately generated buy-in. It means that they could start opinionating and say that segment over there, it looks like our definition of a, let's say, for example, a low value segment. You can see that the spending band sits between X and Y. They've got these types of devices. This is their spending and, and recharge and, and uh, uh, patterns that we typically see. And that becomes such an important milestone to, uh, to reach in any data science project. That ability to be able to relate back what you've done through some complicated algorithm that you can explain that in layman terms back to, to your ultimate consumer. I always refer to my father. My father always told me, Harry, you need to follow the Oma Katie principle. Oma Katie is my grandmother. 
I think she was a typester 500 years ago. Um, she definitely would never understand any of this, but he always told me that if you need to explain or sell something back to a, to a client, you need to be able to explain it to Omar Katie. And um, we can laugh it off as it is, but the principle is a very, very sound one in the sense that when we built our segments, that was our anchor. We needed to look at these segments, identify which ones we are going to target first for predictive modeling and intervention purposes. And these segments we needed to be built in such a way that our client could relate to it, opinionate on it, and educate us on what those, client, uh, that those segments are actually all about. Understand that as a data scientist, I would say more so in consulting, but in any, uh, in any industry, the people that actually work with the data, that work with the clients, they will always know more than the data scientists at the end of the day. Um, and being able to, to, to relay the message, the outcome, the output in such a way that you can collaborate on it together, guaranteed you're on a higher uh, track for the higher probability for, for success. Segmentation is what we started. We then overlaid that with, uh, we essentially took our segments, identified a few initial segments that we're going to target for these campaigns and offers below the line of offers that we were going to value prediction, predicting how, how much a customer is going to spend or recharge with over a given period, and a propensity model that says, is a customer actually going to recharge or spend or uh, you know, trigger some activity um, on the network? Why two models? Well, it's a, it's a very interesting story. We could easily build a, a, a value model that predicts the value and you know, basically incorporate something like you know, a zero value, indicating that someone is not going to be active over a specific period, right? Um, that could kick out some numeric um, uh, score values. So, you know, for example, say 17, 17 megabytes. Uh, but the propensity to have a simpler model supporting it just predicting, look, is this customer or Mrs. Telco more offers to the, to the customer? The conditional model that we assume something is going to happen um, proved to be more accurate at the end of the day. So in combination, we had these three models speaking to one another. We had segments that built that, that profile, identified who we're going to target. We had got a really good accuracy rate on the solution. Then, uh, what, what does this ultimately um, tell us? Why do we have these three recipes to this um, uh, three ingredients to this recipe? Segmentation tells us essentially who is this customer, what does he spend on, um, and typically, you know, how much does he spend? You know, if we were to aggregate it all, value prediction um, is telling us, given that something is going to happen from a spend or a usage point of view, how much is it going to be? If you combine those two components to one another, you can start telling, we know what you're going to buy, we know how much you're going to buy of it. That's the two pieces of the puzzle we solved there. Overlay that with propensity, and then all of a sudden you can ask yourself, well, we know whether he's going to do something, and if he's going to do something, how much he's willing to spend. So if you bring these three things together, you know what he wants, when he wants it, and how much he wants of it at a given point in time. And through our profiling, we could start identifying how much you could afford for it. And these three together, over the sample base that we focused on, is what gave rise to marketing as a service. And it was immensely successful. Let me pepper you guys with some details just around um, some of the algorithms we use, as I've mentioned, for segmentation. Um, we typically try a whole host of them. Um, we started off with K-means. Um, honestly, it did not go well, so we, we had to cut that loose after a while. Um, we went to, to nearest neighbors afterwards, but at the end of the day, it was the SOMS one. It was specifically because it produced an output that our client was very comfortable and familiar with, because they then, at the end of the day, helped us, guided us on what can work for these type of segments, proving to be far more useful um, than, than just a simple algorithm, uh, clustering algorithm. From a propensity point of view, we used quite a lot there also. We used decision trees, random forests, neural networks, D minor regression, a whole host of them at the end of the day. Um, and we actually ended up with a, uh, quite a large ensemble model for this whole thing. Um, but we essentially ended up with different models being selected for value, uh, propensity and value for that matter for different segments. Um, so there was a lot of models that was trained. Um, and then ultimately, at the end of the day, we basically assessed, you know, how they perform given the segments that we were going to target. And then likewise on the value side also. 
slightly less variance actually than the models that we used. It was actually only decision trees ran on forests and networks. Um, we did try gradient boosting, but I think that also tend to come out towards the end. Um, it was largely the random forests um, and the neural networks that performed very well. So those are the three main components that we did, but let's quickly just take a little bit of a harder look at, at some of the key considerations. Obviously, um, a great deal of effort is, is put into our validation test and training sets when we built and prepared for these models to make sure we're not overfitting it. Um, but over and above that, you know, the testing is not just, you know, is what we're doing is fitting, you know, a test set. It's also over time. Um, as I've mentioned, specific people have different paydays in a month. Some have weekly wages, others pay in the middle of the month, others pay towards the end of the month. So depending on where we score these models, we kind of needed to cater for that. Over and above that, even though we can predict the value, we need to be very, very, very careful around where our models are performing poorly. Because it is very easy for us to say, you know what, our average squared error for the model is sitting over there um, or whatever the case might be. Um, but we needed to pay special attention there where we under predicted. Again, coming to that point of cannibalization. If someone is going to spend 10 Rand and we predict he's gonna be spending five Rand and then proposition a seven Rand offer to him, we're gonna end up losing money. So we needed to make very sure that we understand where we are under and over predicting and propose proportionately. They will be performing poorly, be more conservative. They will be very confident, be more aggressive. Um, taking a look at the time. Um, I think we've more or less covered it just here. Um, I just wanna think, yeah. So I think just maybe from, a, from an execution point of view, I'm gonna ask Langton to take us through kind of how we actually operationalize this. Now that we had the business context, now that we've built out a series of product and services for the client, now that we have our segmented base, we selected segments that we felt as right for the solution, we built this value and propensity models on top for each of these segments. And um, essentially, I'm going to ask Langton maybe just to give us a little bit of a walkthrough on, on how um, this was operational. So, so was there a question? Yeah, so maybe just before we do that, Harry, there were a couple of very good questions I sure. that maybe came through. So customer behavior, spending pattern, product mix changes over time. Mm. How do you observe the seasonal changes within your models for a six month base or recent data set? A very, very good question as well. So you might remember right in the beginning, we said that um, in this particular case, our client here kind of focused on acquisitions, in love med management and retention. So one of the things that we did was, when you look at a newly acquired customer, for example, we did have a cut to a point where we said, right, you needed to be with us, cast, uh, with our client for a specific period of time for you to become eligible to move into our solution and then getting these specific offers um, for a number of reasons. First of all, um, as you can imagine, if you only have three or four days of history of a customer, that is simply just not enough to be able to score the models that you built. So there's no point for us to trying to score that customer so you'd be excluded. And that negated quite a lot um, with, with changes in customer holdings and so on and so forth. We also did specifically have um, cases where one of our inputs actually catered for scenarios where we saw someone, let's say, changes in price plan, um, changes in device, and so on and so forth. Ironically enough, you will find that, um, especially in the prepaid market, those type of changes actually doesn't have an enormous impact on the customer itself. Um, you might see, for example, that an upgrade from, upgrade, let's say swap from Samsung to, to, to an Apple iPhone, your, your data usage, yeah, there's a marginal change, but, but not, not major. It's more a case when you move from feature phone to a smartphone, which doesn't happen as often as you might think, especially not at the periods that we were scoring the guys for. Um, so those kind of changes, although we knew we were aware of them when we tested it, they didn't necessarily change our results too much. Um, in terms of seasonal changes, that is a very good one. So we did have our training sets. We did not necessarily use straight lines. We did try and normalize out for seasonality. The only exception to this was two times of the year. One was Black Friday. Black Friday saw very strange behavior on the base and we kind of anticipated that coming. It's ironic that we're having this, this session today. Um, on Black Friday, we see very, very strange behavior. So we were very conservative during that period. Conversely, um, during Christmas periods, we saw actually a big slump, um, specifically around that, that Christmas day period. There we saw a bit of a slump. Um, and from that perspective, we know that we, we could be slightly more aggressive. Um, 
Yeah, sorry, am I answering the full question? Yeah, I, and then I, think, I think that was nicely mm -hmm. done. And then um, for customers who have just joined the client, do you use similar customers' data, say customers from the same area, to make predictions on this new customer? Uh, again, a very good question. Um, but in our case, we only looked at customers that's been with a uh, been with a client for a certain amount of time. Um, so you needed to there were some eligibility rules for you to enter our our solution. And um, if you haven't quite paid your school fees to be there long enough, um, you were excluded. And it speaks to one of the points that that Langton also mentioned. Um, we do have customers that join specifically for acquisition offers. Join now, win a free TV. You throw the SIM card away and you walk away. Um, we wanted to steer clear of those type of customers. Maybe our next session that we have, we can talk about what we did for those guys with acquisition and retention modeling. Um, but um, in this particular case, our newly acquired customers was excluded. There was a couple of exclusion rules, um, and, but being on the base for a period of time was, was one of the major ones. And maybe just to add on to that, that's not necessarily something that we came up with. That is something mm -hmm. that we you know, engage with the client on. Yeah. Um, there are certain uh, rules and policies that they have to follow um, with regards to you know, new customers um, before they enter kind of like into that middle pillar of the CVM uh, life cycle. And um, it's also, you know, sometimes, you know, testing a new solution on these new customers, you know, could yeah. just be potentially just be too risky for everyone involved. Rather yeah. use someone that has had a greater tenure on the base. Um, but I think the key point here is that it's not a decision that we arrived at. It's no. a decision that we undertook with the client and, and made sure that everyone was on the same page with it. I, I want to add to that, Langton. It, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. It's a decision that was made, but it's not like we walked into a meeting saying, guys, we've got this great insight. Um, newly acquired customers, we must exclude it. But obviously, we would have struggled with our models. It speaks to collaboration. When we started this, 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 this engagement, we sat down with them for hours and we talked about what we can do, where the problems are and so on and so forth. And it, it was a decision that was made, but was kind of made in agreement in the sense that they explained to us what happens at the beginning of the acquisition stage of a customer. Um, and from those conversations, we became, it became clear that you know, it would make no sense to target them. Um, and it speaks to that business engagement on the data science projects. You cannot do it without businesses buy-in. On that point, um, maybe something I can mention now, and sorry, Langton, I know we can move on. Um, one of the most engaging conversations that we've actually had in that, on that engagement is, you would believe, would you, whether you believe it or not, we talk about you know, models, we're predicting what people are gonna do, and then we send offers based on these models outputs. Um, a key question is, how do you communicate this product, whatever you wanna call it, how do you, how do you communicate that? And it was, we did some A-B testings at the time to, to kind of um, test what kind of messaging at the time if we largely used SMSs, we had a few other channels as well, but kind of what kind of a message resonates with different customers. Do you start off with a, a big bang greeting, then you know what you're gonna get and then the price, do you start with the price, then some context, then what you get for it. Um, and, and we sat down with some of the call center people in the business and also people in charge of messaging who looked at us and said, you know what? You guys ask us a lot of questions. The reality is we have all the answers already. And they pointed us to a couple of parameters, a few, uh, few guidelines, and uh, our solution absolutely took off um, from the moment we start implementing some of those learnings. Again, just coming to the point that they know the business best. The more you engage, the more you learn through them, and the more you kind of take them on this journey with you, the greater chances you are of success. With that being said, Langton, I think we need to skedaddle. Uh, shall we move on to the next slide where we just want to talk about how we operationalize this? Yeah, exactly. Thank you. And Martin, I note your question, um, and I think um, I can kind of tag this on to the end of the slide. It will be very relevant here. Joseph, uh, maybe we can come to your question at the end. Yeah. So I think um, basically, how did we now, now that we understand what models to use and where it fits into the broader business process, how did we actually kind of go through this? And you can kind of see this as a little bit of a, a summary in everything that what we've said so far. Step number one, forever and always, is the data. Typically, we looked at usage data, spend data, and product data, and all of that was basically summarized into customer daily records. I think one of the things that we haven't spoken about here is that those customer daily records, I mean, if we're dealing with 10, 20, 30 million subscribers on a you know, on a, on a daily basis, um, 
You must understand that every single event that a customer undertakes on his cell phone generates at least one data record that then goes and sits somewhere on the client system. All of those have to be aggregated and summarized, and at the end of the day, they end up in a customer daily record. So even the data that we start working with is you know, at a fairly aggregated level. Um, and of course, we can go further back down the line to get you know, the actual transactional level data um, at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Once we came up with the data and had done all the data exploration and the feature engineering and all of that sort of thing, we start going into the customer segmentation models, right? And the customer segmentation there, as Kerry has mentioned, is really to identify what are the cohorts of the subscribers that we are looking at. Um, and I think a key point is here yeah, is that because you know, these customer segmentation models are non-supervised learning um, uh, machine learning algorithms, there's no way to, there's no target variable, obviously, right? So anything that comes out of it is not right or wrong, right? But is it relevant to the problem that we're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. um, if you come up with a, with a cluster or with a, with a group of subscribers that their cell phone number or the MSISDN ends in the numbers one, three, five, or seven, I mean, that's cool. That might be a true group of customers, but it's not really going to tell you anything about the campaign that you're trying to develop at the end of the day. And it, like, again, this is the whole point about let's not just shovel data into an algorithm and take it out and see if it's worthwhile. It's really applying your mind to see that those, does these segmentations that we get out at the end of the day actually relate back to the business problem, the business problem that we are trying to solve. Mm -hmm. Step number three, of course, is the predictive modeling. This is where we develop the value prediction and the propensity prediction models. Are the customers going to recharge and use data or voice next week? And if they do, how much is that going to be? And this is really the key concept now is let's get into that campaign design. And this is really where uh, the A-B testing became so important. It's Again, it's not just saying here is what we predict. Mr. Client, go off and run with it. It's working with the client to make sure that the campaigns are actually relevant to the subscriber. Um, and Martin, I think this is kind of where your question starts to come in here and I'll address it in a second. But if we are dealing with a customer group, a segment or a cluster that is very data heavy and they use a lot of data, words like voice should not be in there. Words like minutes should not be in there. Conversely as well, if you are dealing with a voice group, why are we, why are we offering them megabytes? And that's really where the campaign design comes in. And then the campaign allocation, that really is then working with the client on the existing infrastructure, on the existing systems, and with the stakeholders to be able to then push these campaigns to the relevant subscribers. I think what is, um, what is extremely important in, in this case here is that we've got to understand that uh, the client has their business as usual activities to run during the course of the day. And it's very important to be able to engage with them and talk to the right people and to have agreements in place to be able to say that we need to send these campaigns out on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, Martin, your question there, and I'll just read it out for the rest of the audience. It sounds like an exploded amount of offerings that clients now needed to manage. What is the process um, that, of change, or well, the change process that the solution introduces? And it really is that, it's working with the client to be able to understand what is possible um, when do we maybe need to take the foot off the accelerator a little bit? When do we need to push a little bit harder? Um, and also what's very important here is that in this sort of environment, words like proof of concept or proof of value are very, very important. Of course, us designing 150 campaigns and implementing it on day one is never going to work, right? And we go through the process of let's start with five campaigns, right? Targeted at a single segment or five campaigns targeted at two or three segments. And we send that out and we see what we see what operational challenges we have there. We then, um, and this really leads into the last point, so I might as well bring it up here. How did those campaigns work, right? Um, were they successful? Was there good uptake? Was there poor uptake? Um, how can we change the messaging? And importantly, can we change the models? Can we feed back into the three different models that we used and then feed, feed around all the way back into the campaign design? How can we continually learn and continually improve and then ramp up um, the amount of new campaigns that you need to implement? This is a process over time. Kerry's going to show you the over time slide in a second. Um, and it really just follows this process on a week by week by week level. 
um, it just keeps going and going and going. And we just try to ramp up, ramp up, ramp up to make sure that until we are really optimally running with the client. And I think that's the real important thing here. This is not Deloitte going off and running, you know, cowboy style um, and really, you know, trying to do things that we, you know, are, like Ferry said, we are the data scientists. We need to work with the business people to understand their base and make sure that it is, um, uh, you know, properly done. Okay. Absolutely. A, a very important question. A very good question also, Martin. Um, it's, um, you might remember I used words like custom experience and so on. Uh, if you guys ever feel like reading up on that, it's an entire field by itself. I advise you uh, Google on foresters and so on. It's a fantastic source to give you some context around that. But inundating customers with a million options, this is a very, very bad idea. Um, you might nudge them towards portions of it over time, but that portions needs to be advised by a little bit of science. Um, LinkedIn is an example, don't push voice on data, don't push SMS on voice, and so on and so forth. Uh, but fundamentally, it comes down, and, and that is what made this solution so important, is it was great value that spoke to what this customer actually wants when he wants it in the amount that he can afford it. Um, and every time it's just this little bit of a stretch, a little bit of a stretch that generated more and more and more value. But to that point, assume we're looking at, also let's assume you're in that base that we were looking at. Let's say in the first month you bought something and we stretch you with one rand. Next month we score our models again, if it, now, if it was a monthly model. Um, and now all of a sudden we're trying to spend you another two rand. At some point you're going to hit a saturation point. Um, and if you keep offering something, especially if it's below the line that has now become unaffordable, then you're going to lose that customer down the line again. So it is a very, very fine balance to push something that's relevant, affordable, and gives the value that's needed, but making sure you realize when you've hit your kind of a saturation point and maintaining him there, either by maintaining with what you're sending to him or offering him a new uh, a suite of packages that, uh, that speaks to, to a similar type of profile. Okay. And I think, sorry, maybe one last point. What's important as well is that over time, we started seeing subscribers that had actually changed their behavior because of the offers that we were pushing to. Mm. So we then had to come up with new offers and new campaigns to make sure that, you know, we had changed their behavior, we had changed their spend. Um, they were at a different point in their customer life cycle than they were when we started. And we have to then understand how we can respond to that and make sure that they, um, uh, you know, remain optimally on the network. Exactly, exactly. And I think the last point I want to mention to that is, it's just around, I've mentioned also the, the enterprise strategy. At the time, believe it or not, the main adopt, uh, plan was actually for people to adopt voice. Everyone was using data and they wanted to cover some of the voice. Um, and you just saw people that never, ever, ever used any voice minutes. At the time, it makes sense. You can call WhatsApp. Um, but what we, what we did was, in order to accommodate that strategy, is you sell it predominantly data by 400, 500 million messages that was sent over a period of, I don't know, almost two years. Um, so an enormous amount of scale that we've achieved towards the end. Um, but there's a few very important lessons that, that I want to point out here. Um, the first is in our first week, in our first week, I think we targeted, it wasn't too many Langton, I think it was probably something like five or 10 or 15,000 customers. In our first week, we sold, I think, 50 units in total. We sat with our hands in our hair thinking, shucks, we've missed the mark. We're predicting wrong. We're offering things that's not relevant. You know what happened was actually the client that came and sat with us and said, look, um, this is completely normal. If you start something new, you need to have the patience to check if it's going to build up, to ramp up, to get the word of mouth going, to understand the value and the adoption will come. Um, furthermore to that, that feedback loop that, that, that Langton just showed also became so important because what we started to see over a period of time was that we essentially had a scenario where um, we realized, okay, we've got, for example, let's use an example, for 10 Rand, you can buy 100 megabytes of data. Let's assume that's one of the, the, the bundles that we, that we pr propose to customers. Um, one of the things that, that um, we realized is that we price correctly, but we don't time it always 100%. Um, if I was to offer someone 10 Rand's worth of, of data if for a two-week period, and that person, for example, gets paid loan, uh, weekly loan uh, wages um, of only five, and only five rand of that's available um, to spend on, on, on telecommunication services. Well, 
well, then that becomes an enormous issue because you are actually at no point in time are you able to afford what we're offering and you know, offering that customer, even though it's perfect. So from that perspective, these learnings kept creeping in. We kept implementing it. We kept adjusting our models, our segmentation, our offerings, how we message, how we measure, and so on and so forth. And it was literally just consistently believing what you're doing, following the evidence, following the advice of the people in the business that knows this inside out, that allowed for this steady grow um, in, in, in uptakes as we went up. Of course, we had ups and downs. Um, there was operational challenges from time to time. Um, that will always happen, especially in this particular environment. Um, we did grow the number of customers over time that we could target as a function of more segments. Um, and by that, by that extent, um, you know, we, we did see a growing uh, impact on, on this particular customer base. I think the main takeaways that we took here was in our initial couple of months, we, on the people that actually bought our, our campaigns, um, you know, we saw about a 15% growth in the ARPU. So I think it's, sorry, so Tim, we didn't spend time on earlier, it's average revenue per user. Uh, but initially we saw a 15% growth that grew to 30 um, over the next phase, that grew to 35 over the phase of that, ending up to about 40% uptick in ARPU for those customers um, that they converted on these items within the segments that we targeted. Um, and it very much is a function of continuous improvement uh, making better what you have, taking those lessons learned, spending time to understand where you're winning and where you're losing, tap into what you're winning and consistently refine there where you are losing um, and communicate that and get the input from the, the, the stakeholders specific to the business and the people that know it the best. I want to conclude then just with, um, sure, we're going to cut this fine. Just with a couple of final lessons learned, I'm going I'm, uh, gonna to just quickly run through them as fast as I can. Um, and I, Get this out of the way. Um, as I said, the, the, the intent today, guys, was really to show you guys a advanced analytics or machine learning use case that we've implemented at Telcos in South Africa. Um, but I mean, you could, the, the intent here is not to give you guys the code of a neural network that we built. The intent here was to show you guys how that collaboration between business and data science take place. We had an enormous amount of success here, but an immense amount of that success came from leveraging and understanding what business wants, how they use it, and so on and so forth. Understand the problem before you start looking at that technical solution. And it can be extended to any data science project. Let me give a practical example. Um, if someone was to ask me right now, look, build me a model to predict to me, um, you know, which culture, is it a month, two months, six months, a year? Also, what do you want to do with that model? Do you want to use it to proactively maybe chase leads and prevent churn? Do you want to understand the drivers of churn? Um, how, who is going to use it? How they're going to use it? Understanding that context. If, if we trip on that step, there's, there's very little chance of success down the road. Um, be patient. What you have sometimes takes time to materialize. I'll quote one of the, I think one of the previous heads of advanced analytics um, in, in, in Vodafone. Um, he once told me that, look, he typically gives it about two months to see if something ramps up. If it doesn't have, you know, admit that we might have got something wrong, pull it, yank it off, try again. Um, but if something doesn't work within a day or two days or a week, you've not given it enough time. Have patience, work with samples, do your testing and make sure and, and make your decision when sufficient time has passed. Um, and then just again, data science is a fantastic area, uh, a fantastic field with endless, endless amount of possibilities. And um, it's very nice to be able to sit, do this work. It's technical. You can see the impact that you make. You can see the charts go up because of your models. It's very rewarding. But being the smartest guy in the room is only going to help you so far because it's typically not going to be another data scientist that's going to look you in the eye and say, yes, your model is the one that we need. It's going to be someone else. And being able to communicate what you've done, why it's right, how it works. Uh, in this particular case, we had a um, uh, uh, we built this the solution in specific software. Um, in my my advice to you all is have an understanding of how things work, but be flexible in your tooling. Um, what you might build in SAS one day might be required in Python the next day, and an R the, the day after uh, the day afterwards. Um, so being a you know expert in a software is fantastic and there's definitely niches for that but i, I would definitely feel that the strong data scientist um, is capable of managing a couple of 
of softwares. And then my last point before I just want to see if there's any final comments or questions is the business will know the business better. And the more you leverage off them, the more you take them on this journey, the more information you're going to get to make some smart decisions. Okay. Guys, that brings me to the end of my um, uh, uh, presentation, my Langton. So Langton quickly needed to um, leave the room. Um, but I just want to see if there's any major questions that I can maybe field right now. Um, let me switch off my fancy laser here. I think there's only one by day. Okay. Sure, let me have a look there. Uh, goodness me, Joseph, Joseph, Joseph. Is that I was going to ask about the it's random here, uh, To what extent do you include macroeconomic factors into customer churn? An example being COVID. Ah, that is a very, very good question. Um, I've actually not done that myself just yet, um, but we do actually do quite a lot of work in it. Look, realistically, um, all industries everywhere took an enormous knock um, when COVID came. There was no playbook to reference. Um, it's not like that we knew exactly what it was going to do, um, but it's, it's definitely something that needs to be taken into account. When it comes to churn modeling, which is not quite what we did here, um, when it comes to churn modeling, I would definitely include macroeconomic factors. The last one I did was actually for an insurer. And ironically enough, the macroeconomic factors was not necessarily what drove the model at the end of the day. Um, so I would always consider it, but honestly, I don't know, was it Jacob that asked it? Yeah, so it's not something that I've done, uh, that, that I've done myself before in terms of measuring the impact of COVID. That is, is, is I think, currently a very, very uh, niche area. It's something that, that the actuaries on our team uh, uh, focuses on and specialize, uh, specializes in. Um, and if there was ever a need for us to build a churn model, we would definitely need to take that into account. Um, even if nothing else your current history of data is going to be heavily heavily impacted by anything COVID related so you would definitely need to make a few adjustments but as I said macroeconomic factors itself um, it is not something that I've actually seen come through extremely strongly but Jacob my gut tells me it must be, it must always be considered um, because surely during a depressed economic uh, period you would expect more um, more uh, uh, churn but you know what the, the, the reality of it is, is that it is always correlated with something else that the customer has, that's, uh, you know, whether that be spend, recharges, tenure, um, the rate at which you get, uh, acquire, the rate at which you lose. Um, it, it, I think at the end of the day, we, there's just a strong uh, multicollinearity with, with um, the variables that you already look into. Um, yeah, you know where I have seen it work? I want you to predict the price of wood. Then we had uh, the macroeconomic variables prove <laughs> to be quite useful. Um, but apart from that, it's not actually something that I've seen work very well. My personal experience, I'm sure there are cases where it will work. Therese, maybe um, any final questions before I we wrap up this session? That seems to be it. Thank you so much, Harry. And thank you to Langton in his absence. Uh, I see I will he tell left the, the room. Uh, I think that was an amazing presentation. Uh, it's really given us insight into the back end of solving this kind of problem which i think is often yeah. not that simple to get so i just want to thank you guys so much for your time uh, i'd also just like to thank all of those of you that have joined us and just to say that we're looking forward to starting our dsat webinar series again in february of 2022 and have a wonderful afternoon everyone thank you thank you so much Phil. stay safe and have a good monday cheers the university of johannesburg the future reimagined